Welcome to the Travis Johnson YouTube channel. I hope that this message inspires you to live your life for God and your city. Enjoy the message. The question is today as we close out our message series asking for a friend is how do I keep faith in God in changing times? Now I have to confess, I have massaged this title, this question down to a more brief title. I'm gonna give you my first try at that and then I'm gonna give you the original question. I had it moved down to this. When culture is changing so fast, how do we stay positive and keep faith in God? And the first question was this, verbatim. Our elected leaders are turning more and more away from God How do we stay positive and keep faith in God? Is there anyone that's ever had this question before? Ever, ever. If that's you, just go ahead and raise your hand. You go, what in the world is going on in the world? And so I wanna talk to you about that today. And let me address this, first of all, because this is so much more than about elected leaders. This is about cultural change. It's about things that are going on in our world. And you see things that happen. You're like, holy cow. To me, it feels like the last 18 months have had the most accelerated change in my entire life. And I know things have changed very rapidly. You know, the internet did a lot of that. TV media did a lot of that. Radio broadcast did a lot of that. But it seems to me that there has been more cultural movement in the last 18 months than my entire lifetime combined. And so when you're doing that, to me, it feels like, have you ever been whitewater rafting before? Whitewater rafting, you get into a class four, class five rapid, and you have the white water there, and you can put your oar into the water, and when you stroke, you don't really go a whole lot of places because the white water is churning. You're stroking through water and air, and it's, you, know, you can get caught up in the rapids. You just don't know. It's not that you're going downstream. You could actually be going upstream in a rapid. It's just turbulence. So we've found ourselves in turbulence. So let me address this first of all concerning the political leaders, and then I'm going to move into the larger principle. Now, is there any human being in this place that has voted for somebody and got exactly what you wanted? Has that ever happened? It's never happened. It's never happened. In fact, in this room, there are no two people that agree on everything all the time. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. It, it doesn't happen. If you're going into a relationship, lower Lower your sights, lower your expectations, lower the expectations, lower, lower the expectations because you're going to be disappointed, first of all. Second of all, there is no doubt in my mind that we have political leaders all over the place that are compromising biblical truth, moral truth, moral truth. Absolute truth does not exist in people's minds today. People say, hey, you just, you gotta be true to yourself or what is your truth? Let me tell you, there is no such thing as your truth. Truth is truth, whether you like it or not. I'll tell you, I'm just gonna, I've been, I've been stepping all over all kinds of eggshells lately. I just kinda don't care. It's that, it's tis the season, you know. When Dave Chappelle has more moral courage than the preachers in our pulpits, brothers and sisters, there's a problem. When Dave Chappelle is getting canceled for saying gender is a fact, and preachers and scientists and medical doctors and people that are in hard science can't say that God created them male and female. Houston, we got a problem. We're in a change in time. We're in a change in time. Look, that's not to say that I don't like you or anything like that. I'm just saying, look, I'm just saying. Truth is truth. How do we, pastor, how do we keep faith during a time like this? How do we keep faith? Well, let me just tell you something. It'll make your life a whole lot better if you realize this truth about what we 
as the people of the way or people of the gospel or Christians, people who are followers of Christ. The reality is it doesn't matter who's in the state house or who's in the White House. All that matters is who's in the house of the Lord. And when our trust and our hope and our faith isn't hanging on who's in Pennsylvania Avenue, but instead our hope and faith is dependent on who hung on the cross, that's when everything gets okay. All we need is Jesus. He's all that we need. My joy is not dependent on who's in office. My joy is dependent on Jesus Christ. Okay, but you do need to know what season we're in because you gotta, you gotta suit up. You gotta suit up. Listen, Christian mother and Christian father, it's not okay just to tell our kids that they need to wait until they get married before they have sex. You gotta give them the why that's in this book. Uh, you, you can't say you need to wait uh, until, don't have sex right now because you're just too young and you'll end up having a baby. You tell your kids that kind of stuff. At some point they'll say, I'm old enough, I can handle myself. Uh, I, I, I'm not gonna have a baby, and then they go off. Listen, we gotta get God's word down into their lives. We gotta, the, the, the why has to outlive our parenting, right? Because as soon as they get out of our house, then they're gonna go do what they wanna do. But if they hide the word of God in their heart, then it won't just be about their sexual morality, but it'll also be about their character, their integrity, their word, uh, truth, the way they treat other people, the way they love people that don't love them back, the way they love people that are different from them. When they get the word of God, then it'll get down deep inside of them. There is a truth, and there is a man who is the truth, the spirit of truth. I'm thankful for Father God. I'm thankful for his son, Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit. I'm thankful for the word of God that transforms us because we need it in times like these. I want you to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. David has here outlined the different leaders that followed him into battle. And they, they named them... Um, like, I, I, I would go and list my warriors. You know, I would list the Grizzards. You know, I would list the Doherty's. I would list the Betzolds. I would list the Salmons. You know, I would list the Booths. I would list the Harwells. I would talk about those families. I, I would talk about the Laguerres and all the things that God was doing through their life. You know, I would, I would, I would talk about the, the Smiths. I would talk about the Haggards and God's faithfulness through their lives. This is what David was doing here. There was one particular family that had a particular strength, a particular weapon in their arsenal. Verse 32 of chapter 12 says this, from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. All these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. Now these were special kinds of leaders that they understood the moment they were in and they understood what to do in that moment. Now, let me tell you, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram has proven that there's lots of people that know the times and they know what they don't like. It's covered up in people that whine and complain and tweet and all of that stuff, but where are the solutions? Where are the solutions? See, this is what Issachar had. The, son, the sons of Issachar, the tribe of Issachar, the warriors of Issachar, they knew the moment and they knew the proper response in the moment. This is who we're called to be right now. We're called to be this because the battles that we're fighting right now are mostly not in armor with swords and spears. Our battles are against ideologies that have corrupted the church, that have corrupted culture, that have hijacked all kinds of legitimate movements and kind of sprinkled in arsenic. And the church of Jesus Christ, in a lot of cases, has fallen for those ideologies. It happens a little bit at a time, but then the next thing you know, you have churches that were once faithful and named after great reformers that are now completely compromised, listen, apostate churches. And let me just say, if you are in a church that is preaching open violation of the scripture that denies the authority of the word of God and the inerrancy of the word of God, let me tell you, 
you get you a new church or get you a new pastor. And to anybody that's here in Mobile, if you've got some joker that's preaching some other word than the word of God, let me tell you, I got a seat right here for you at Pathway Church. Now, I, we got some gospel faithful churches in this city, some amazing churches, amazing pastors, amazing small group leaders and people who are serving, elders and deacons. Praise God, Lord, fill those churches up. But the, and now let me bring it just a little more personal. When the ideology comes to your house and to your life and you can pick and choose from this book what you're going to believe in and what you're not going to believe in, let me tell you, you are in the same place. This is the moment that we're in right now. And so we've got to discern that time. And here's a prescription I want to give you really quickly that will help us in that. Okay, first of all, knowing the God of the Bible will help you know in the dis and discern the times. You can't... You can't recognize the counterfeit if you don't know the genuine. You gotta get in the word of God. June, you gotta get in the Bible. You gotta get in the word, you gotta know God. You don't need to just know him on the page, but you need to know him, you need to know him in relationship. You gotta spend time in prayer. You gotta spend time reflecting on him, thinking about him and blessing him, speaking of him. And secondly, secondly, in those times, no matter what we can discern and what we can see, having joy in God is our flow regardless of our times and our leaders. So there are some things that are not our problems to solve. There are some moments and times and season that it's our job to be faithful in those seasons and times. Here's what I know. The person I'm most responsible for is me. I want to get this right. How do we do that? How do we do that in this moment? What moment are we in? Let me tell you, the moment that we're in, we are in Babylon right now. I thank God for a Joshua generation. I thank God for a Joshua generation. A generation where everywhere we put our foot, we are taking that ground. I believe it. I believe I'm a Joshua. I do. I thank God for the promised land. I thank God for Jerusalem. But this moment that we're in, we are in Babylon we're more like Jeremiah than we are like Joshua. We're more like Daniel than we are like Joshua. We're more like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, faithful in the moment. We're more like Moses right now than we are like Joshua. So here's what I want to do today. If this is our moment, if we have been carried off into captivity and our culture is denying everything that we find to be holy, how do we thrive in this moment? Do we just complain about it? Or how many of you say, Pastor, I want to be effective in that moment? I want to thrive. I want to succeed. I want to rise. I want to move forward. I want to be faithful with my family. How many of you want to see your family, all of your family, walk right into the presence of God when their time is up? You, you, that's your biggest prayer. It's your biggest prayer. So let, let, me, let me kind of help you right here. Uh, we're going to talk about how to thrive in Babylon. First, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 3. The Bible says, King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it upon the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all of these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted, now, up until this moment, things had been going pretty good for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had been carried off into captivity. And you see this time and time again. The way it did, happened is when Babylon, when, when Babylon conquered Israel, they carried off the smartest, the strongest, the most handsome, all the princes, all the, all the people who were just like coming up to the top, the educators, the doctors, they carried off the knowledge base of Israel into captivity. And so the knowledge base is there, and then they used them, and this is one of the reasons these empires continue to grow, because they had all these competitive advantages living right there in their kingdom. This, happened, this is the same thing that happened in Cambodia. 
where we do so much ministry. The Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot wiped out all of the leaders, all of the educated people, all of the business leaders, all of the doctors. If you were educated, they took you out. If you wore glasses and looked like you could read, they took you out. These people are now in Babylon. They're no longer in Jerusalem. And remember the story about how they were given a particular diet they were supposed to eat. And so the three Hebrew children, they stand in that moment and they were faithful in that moment. The Lord gave them good words to navigate that. They, they, weren't just, they didn't just throw them out there and let the chips fall where they may. They, they, they put some touch on that past. They worked through that thing. And things are going well. Things are going well and they just, they have leadership responsibility. Actually, the king placed them in leadership they're in the kingdom. And so they are elevated people. Just when everything gets right, the herald shouted, people of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. Now, there wasn't a PA system. So I imagine he was standing up on some elevated place, voicing out over the sea of people that had come out, that had been brought out. They had been brought out by the governors, the mayors, the city council, all the leaders brought all the leadership out, all these folks out. He said, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground, to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. They're going, you've got to be kidding me right now. In a moment, they experience their fight or flight response. For me, this is what it's like. I don't know how it is for you. I have a metallic taste in my mouth as adrenaline jumps. I might shake or I might like really muscle up and later as I come down off of that adrenaline, then I shake. I get that tunnel vision. Like I can't see, the only thing I'm waiting for is for Porky Pig to pop out and say, that's all folks. You know what I mean? It's like I can't see anything but what's going on right there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going, holy cow, this is how this thing This is how this thing is going to end. The herald continues. Anyone who refuses to obey will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So that's what happens. And when everyone, when the horns blow, everyone bows, and out across this great sea of people, there's three teenage boys from Pathway students just standing right there. Maybe one of them, maybe one of them is standing there locked knee, like, all right, you're gonna take me out? This is my last thing? Yeah, I'm taking. You're taking me out. I'm defiant. He might have been standing there just like that. The other one might have been like, oh, my goodness, I cannot believe I'm doing this. Like an out-of-body experience. He's just going, this is the craziest thing. What's going through their minds right now is they have come through. They have been faithful to the Lord their entire life. They were faithful in Babylon. They were faithful with the dietary restrictions. And God elevated them. And now here they are in this moment And they're being called to bow to a statue. They're being called to uh, violate one of the first four of the Ten Commandments. One of the first four was called vertical commandments, relating to our relationship with God. That we should have no other gods before him. Now, the last six are God's commandments and how we engage with people. Of course, when Jesus comes... Jesus says, when he's asked, what's the most important commandment? He said, well, this is the most important one. The second one is like it. 
Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's the first four commandments. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's the last six commandments. Jesus said, if you've done these two things, then you have fulfilled the law. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to simplify it <clears throat> and point us through Jesus. They were being called upon to violate the most important of the Ten Commandments. And they had to make a choice right there in that moment. So some, some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. How do we thrive in Babylon? How do we have faith in God during changing times? How do we have joy when we're being asked to compromise the very core values of our lives as believers in Jesus Christ. Is anybody living there right now? Have you, are you facing some things right now, some things that you're being asked to do that violate your conscience? And the truth is, yeah, I won't, don't want anybody to raise their hand for this, for this next part, but I mean, the truth is, so many of us have compromised when the heat turned up, when the furnace got hot, when we were called to bow. You know, can I just say that really right? All of us have at some point bowed to some other God other than Jesus. Listen, we shall have no other gods before him. How do we do this and how do we thrive? Let me give you five ways. First of all, number one, you have to know that God is who he says he is. And if he isn't who he says he is, go get another God. If God's a liar, Trade them in for somebody else or follow yourself. Follow your own ideologies that have not been working for you. But if you're going to thrive in Babylon, you've got to be fully convinced that God is who he says he is. Let me tell you, when challenges come your way and the pressure is on, you better be able to stand in that moment. That's when it matters. It's not a big deal for you to stand for Jesus when everything is good. What matters is when you're in the fire. I've had all kinds of friends that asked me to get out on a limb with them, and then I turn around and I see them sawing the limb off. That asked, they asked me to get on. I thought, what kind of thing is going on here? When the pressure gets turned up, people act all kinds of different ways. Isaiah, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 4, verse 20, um, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God, he was fully convinced. Say that with me, fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. We have to know that God is who he says he is. Let me tell you, God can rescue me from cancer. But if he doesn't, I'm not going to bow. Pathway Church, God can get you out of that financial turmoil that you're in. You're a tither. You're a giver. You attend church. You love Jesus. God can get you out of it. But Pathway Church, if he doesn't, you're not going to bow. We, we got to be fully convinced. It, it, uh, we aren't following God if he does what we want him to do. If that's who God is, he isn't really God, is he? He's like our little trained animal on a string that has to do what we say we want to do. To sit, speak, speak, ubu, speak. Good dog. <laughs> no. He's either God or he isn't. We have to know that. Number two, we have to know that more pressure is coming. 
More pressure is coming. Well, uh, you know, I stood for the Lord when the dietary restrictions came, and I was faithful in that moment, and God advanced me. But what is this? Now I'm standing in the city square, and I'm being asked to bow before God. Listen, more pressure is coming. But pastor, you don't understand. I took a stand for the Lord. Yeah, you took a stand for the Lord, but the enemy is not going to just give up territory that he's gained without a, without a fight. There's more pressure that's gonna come. You have in your family said, you know what, it's time for my, my family will be in the house of the Lord. My family's gonna be in the house of the Lord. The days of my kids waking up saying, I just don't feel like going to church, that's over. Guys, fellas, ladies, from now on, when the doors to the church are open, we're in the church house. That's really great that you said that. I'm so thankful. Pathway Church, everybody say that, okay? I want everybody to say that. If God is who God says he is, we ought to come and worship him, right? Well, let me tell you, next week, <laughs> Mama, I don't want to go. I, I don't feel good. I don't feel good. I got a fever. That joker's been over there cuddling with a lamp, trying to just w- warm up, <laughs> you know. Mama, I, I'm, so, I'm so tired. You came in an hour after curfew. Uh, you're already in trouble for that. And now I'm not going to let that m- cause you to miss out something. If you, you're going to go to church, and if you fall asleep, I'm going to whoop your tail all the way home. You know, you, there's some things that we got to fight for. There's more pressure that's coming. But Lord, I stood for you in the city square when everyone else bowed. Surely you're going to show up for me. No, let me tell you, there is a furnace that's over there waiting for you. There is more pressure that is coming. Pathway Church, I just want to tell you the truth because you just need to hear the truth. When we come to Jesus, everything doesn't just automatically get easy. When we come to Jesus, we are going to have to battle against even our own flesh. Paul says that my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. The things that I want to do, it's hard for me to do. And the things I don't want to do, it's so easy for me. It's first, it's just, it's natural. Pastor, I was just born like this. I know, I know. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. We gotta fight this stuff. There's more pressure that's coming. But there's some good news over here. There's some good news over here. I mean, we're looking, we're looking, we're looking. You know, we're looking at this pressure. God, won't you save me from the fire? The Lord's saying, no, baby. I'm gonna get down in the fire with you. I'm gonna walk you through the fire. The third thing you need to know is that there is promise in the fire. Isaiah chapter 43, verses one through three. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed the one who formed you. For I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. God's going to bring you through. Have you had some financial difficulty? The Lord's going to bring you through. I don't, I don't want to repeat 2020 again. I just don't. I don't. Wouldn't it have been awesome if God had just taken COVID right out? It would have been awesome. Did anybody pray for that? I prayed for that. But let me tell you, God got right down in that pandemic with us. And I honor you because while we were going through that, you were out in this parking lot putting food in people's cars. You were feeding hospitals. You were taking pharmacy medications to our at-risk population. Thank you. Thank you. Let me tell you, the only way we were able to do that is that God was right down in the middle of all this stuff with us. He didn't take us out of the fire. He walked through the fire with us. I got COVID in January of this year. It was really easy for me. It was not a big deal. You know, that's not the case for everybody. It was a challenge. It's been a challenge. In 2000, it'd be 2005, 2006, 
We had another nice little gift that came to us from China. It's called Chinese drywall in our house. It's like the gift that keeps on giving. Um, I mean, the standards of manufacturing are different than ours. Like, they put lead paint on toys. Kids in the United States die. You can't sue them. You don't get any money for that. They just take the CEO out, shoot them, and they say it's done. That's literally what happens. So they put Chinese drywall in our house that was emitting sulfuric acid. I had to get glasses. Our, some of our kids got asthma. Um, we all had bloody noses just randomly all the time. Um, Dr. Stock Kelly had MS. And about one out of every five or six Sundays that I was preaching, my face would swell up. I mean, just, I have never texted the picture to anybody because I don't trust anybody with the picture. It'll be on Facebook. As I'm laughing, Andrew's going, please send me the picture. <laughs> yeah, I showed you. I showed you, yeah. I'll show you. You have to come talk to me for it. But, you know, I, I thought, at first I thought, you know, I just need to go preach and just kind of go through this. Nobody would have heard a word I said. They would be like, what is going on with pastor right now? So I just give my notes. I give my notes to somebody else to go preach for me. I mean, at the last second, at the very last second. For four years, we battled with that stuff. Kelly and I moved out of our house. It was our dream house. We had flipped homes. We put everything that we had on over into that home. I felt like we had gotten way out ahead uh, uh, for our age, for where we, it was just a really wonderful time. You know, I walk into the house, I look up at these high ceilings and I thought, wow, Travis, you've really done a good job. What a foolish thing to say, first of all. But the sense of loss that I had from that incredible challenge. You know, God protected us through all of that stuff. But for four years, every day, I thought, my church deserves a pastor that's not as complicated as I am. Now, the conversation was always going on in my mind, but I don't think anybody else really was down in that with me. But it was a complicated, complicated time for us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get put into the fiery furnace, into this furnace. The Bible says that they were bound. They they had chains. The fire, when the temperature came up, it melted and broke the chains off of them. Can I just be really honest and transparent with you today? That what we went through with our house, with this tremendous financial loss that we experienced, with the physical disruption that we had, the disruption to our work and our life, Let me tell you what happened in that time. The chains in our lives fell off. Yes, there was a financial challenge, but I promise you, we reorganized our values because of that, because we had nothing else. It was in that time that we decided that we wanted to go all in with our family, that our family was our best work of art that we possibly had, that we just wanted to give ourselves completely to our family. We made some decisions, like one of the decisions we made is that we wanted to take our kids to all 50 states before they graduated from high school. And so whenever we got a break, man, we started looking at our map, cities that we hadn't gone to, and we began to drive to all those cities, do road trips. It was an awesome time for us. In order to do that, to be able to pay for that, it meant we couldn't have new cars. So we had, uh, I went and bought Kelly a $1,000 minivan. I saw it on the side of the road. There was some duct tape on it. It ran, the air conditioning worked most of the time. That's how we were able to finance that season of our life. But I'll tell you what, the chains, the expectations, the agendas, the goals that we had, as noble as they are, they fell off of us and our family became different. We steward our resources and our lives differently today because of that. What Satan meant for evil, he meant to discourage us, he meant to break us, but God used that to break chains off of our life. He did it for us, he can do it for you. There's protection in the fire. And lastly, there's promotion after the fire. Daniel chapter 3. And if you would, just go ahead and stand with me, please. Say this with me. There's promotion after the fire. Come on, one more time, all together. There's promotion after the fire. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted. He had just thrown him into the fire. Remember that? Threw him in. He threw him in. Some of his men died. 
before they could even get to the furnace. It was so hot on the outside. I see four men walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted. Keep in mind, this is the guy who just, he's declared that he's God. He wants everyone to bow to his statue. He says this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, the officials, the governors and advisors, all of Nebuchadnezzar's downline crowded in so that they could see what was going on with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who Nebuchadnezzar just called servants of the most, most high God, the almighty God. Let me just tell you about our God. He's God, and he's not a mighty God. He is the almighty God. And you can't get mightier, more mightier, almightier than the almighty. Almighty is almighty. He's just the boss. And Shadrach, it seems to me, stepped to that furnace as if it was an altar call, and he converted the way that he believed to believe, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <clears throat> These officers saw that the fire had not touched them, not a hair on their head was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent an angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. <clears throat> they defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Let me just say, if you're willing to compromise God so that you can get a promotion at that job, so that you can get a date with that girl, so that you can get acceptance of your peer group, let me tell you, you are not worthy of the kingdom of God. Pastor, what, why are you talking so rough? I'm talking to you straight. I'm talking to you plain, just plain English. We're beating around the bush way too much and our sons and daughters are dying for it. Our families are losing out on Jesus because of it. Because of their faithfulness. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, listen, he's saying, I'm making a decree for all the nations, including those of you that are citizens of Babylon. You were born here. You're four, five, ten generations from here. Even you, if you don't abandon or if you trash talk the God of these three men, then this is what I'm going to do. You will be torn limb from limb and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no God who can rescue like this. Now, let me just say, first of all, King Nebuchadnezzar was a new follower of God. He didn't know better. That's not how you give an altar call. I'm just saying that's not how you do it. But I guarantee you, there's a bunch of people that God was faithful to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Not only did they get promoted, but Nebuchadnezzar was promoted. His life was changed in this moment. Then the king, and here comes the promotion of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. That's it. That's the deal. You want to thrive in Babylon? Be faithful to Jesus. You, you, want, to, you want to thrive in Babylon? You, you want that great romantic relationship? Then focus on your relationship with Jesus and all that stuff will sort out. You want to have those friends? You want to feel accepted? You want to feel loved? You want to feel seen? You want to feel known? You want to feel validated? Validate your creator, the God of all creation. You do that. And let me tell you, I may not get one more person to the church. There are some churches that would run me off for preaching like that. 
But I'll tell you, I would rather be with Jesus all by myself than a bunch of jokers like that that would turn their back on God when the trumpet blows. We can thrive. Our businesses can thrive, not just in Jerusalem, but also in Babylon. This is our moment, Pathway Church. This is what we've been created for. For 71 years, we have carried the name of Pathway Church or Pathway Temple or Indian Springs. God has done incredible things. God did not bring us here on the backs of faithfulness and sacrifice and dedication to Jesus just so that you can go weak, just so that you can become a diet Christian or or a, a Christian light. God wants to do mighty things in you in this moment. And let me say the challenge, the challenge is a little different for us than it was for our forefathers. In that season, in that season, maybe you got a bonus for being a Christian. Maybe you got some benefits for having your church bumper sticker on your window. But in this season, There may be people looking at your bumper sticker just waiting for you to mess up to say, see, I knew you were a hypocrite. You're all hypocrites. No, in this season, we will thrive. In this season, we will demonstrate the love of God to every human being in this city. In this season, we will see transformation. In this season, we will see salvation. In this season, we will see renewal. In this season, God will continue to build the foundations and raise the roof. God will continue to expand the borders of our tent. We will increase, we will not decrease. We will advance, we will not shrink back. We will move forward. We are above, we are not beneath. We we are victorious, we are not victims. God is mighty in us. No matter what's in our past, no matter what was done to us as children, no matter what people say about us, we are those who are called out. We are the elect. We've been chosen by God. He loves us. He died for us. He's renovating us. He's renewing us. He loves you with every single core of his fiber. And this is our moment. Thank God for Babylon. Thank God for the king. Thank God for anyone that God would elevate. And thank God that he would use us to share his grace in this moment. What a privilege it has been to be a part of this Asking for a Friend series. Eight weeks of this. Y'all ask crazy questions during COVID. Crazy. Normally the questions you get in asking for a friend are, can I drink a beer and be a Christian? That's the kind of stuff that you get. Here it's like, is the vaccine the mark of the beast? That's the kind of questions that you get. It has been awesome. We have grown numerically. We have grown spiritually. God is renovating our hearts. Praise God that whatever question that we have, it is answered in Jesus. It's here in this book. The Holy Spirit will lead us where this book has some incomplete sentences where we have to depend on him. And in all of that, in all of that, when we still don't know every little bit of thing, Let me tell you, the Bible tells us that right now we see through a glass darkly, but one day, June, face to face, we will see Jesus and we will know everything that we need to know and we will be captured in his arms and we will worship him for eternity. It'll be amazing. It'll be amazing. Thank you, Pathway Church, for walking in integrity. Thank you for walking with character. Thank you for loving the Lord with passion. Thank you for asking real questions and thank you for seeking. Take your family into this book. Take yourself into this book. We got a long road ahead of us. It's gonna be an awesome journey and God isn't finished. Come on, one more time. Let's bless the Lord today and let's honor him. I hope you've been blessed by this week's message. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you never miss another message. We'll see you next week.